uh, Dr. Margulies because I was faculty with him at Hofstra for a few years. And um, great guy, but long and short of the point is that um, I was one of you guys and part of your community for a little while. And it is delightful, and I'm very happy to be back visiting. So, in any event, before we get started talking about taxes. There are two important things that I that I want to bring up, and, and one, two are uh, disclosures, I suppose, and the other is something with preamble. Normally, I just ramble, but not preamble. <laughs> so, <laughs> disclosures. I wanted to put these up here because oftentimes, if you're speaking in a positive way about vaccine, uh, people assume that you are in some way being compensated to do so. So, I work for a university. I do not work for any companies. I work with a couple of companies. One is called Begin Analytics, and they are, uh, we are working together on a Lyme disease diagnostic test. And another is called Exoximus, and they make a disinfectant for, to treat um, um, MRSA and MRSA, surgical site infections. So, neither of them make, vac neither of them make vaccines. I used to work in a vaccine center at UConn, but um, we made veterinary vaccines. So in any event, I am trying to communicate that I don't really have a dog in this fight other than I'm a scientist. I appreciate truth. I'm a person who works in medicine and does not like to see sick people if it's avoidable. And the other part is that I, I am a mom of these two critters, and um, and they have all their all their vaccines. So that's another thing that that sometimes people say. Would you give your kids that? Yes, would did all the time <laughs> that it was that it was supposed to happen. So those are my disclosures and and my and my setup. So I wanted to start this by telling a story. So this is a picture of the classroom that I teach in. It, it looks like a bananas sort of cafeteria, but it's actually a very neat room. Um, this is called Better Hall at our College of Medicine. It's got all round tables, and they're, it's about the size of a basketball court on the inside, and there are six screens around the room because we like to stop. In our curriculum, this is related to vaccines, I promise. Um, and one of those things is that every Thursday, for whichever cases we've been working on that week, um, we do a big group session, which we call Team Case Challenge. So there's one big case that's presented by a physician and or co-presented by a physician and a basic scientist. And we ask certain open-ended questions and we have our student doctors sit at their table and discuss things and come up with treatment things. So, Back in September, I was talking with, uh, with one of my colleagues, and we were planning a team case challenge. And the week that week, uh, sorry, the case that week was a well patient case. So, you know, we thought, how are we, how are we going to do that? What's, what case should we talk about? And um, my colleague, um, Kat Brandt, is a primary care doc. And she said, actually, that's a perfect thing. And she had a patient um, who was a pediatric patient. And he came in with his mom. And his, his mom said, um, he's had some vaccines, but I don't want him to get any more. And so he had, you know, this was discussed during making of the appointment. So she said, all right. And she was prepared to have the autism conversation. And what ended up happening was mom didn't care about the autism thing. She knew that that wasn't an actual problem and she wasn't worried about that. Um, what she was worried about was that she had read that there were some crazy ingredients in vaccines. And in fact, there was a fetal tissue in vaccines. And she didn't want she didn't want her kids exposed to that. And um, my, my colleague replied, where are you getting this information? And she said, from the CDC. 
which the response was, I can't possibly be right, but I don't have that information at my fingertips right now. And so things escalated a bit, blah, blah, blah. The situation was resolved and clinical decisions were made and what have you. Be that as it may, the point is we wanted to discuss this with our students because the punchline to this story was that if you pull up the CDC website, which I have links for you in a couple of slides, it does indeed say fetal tissue and fetal components are a vaccine ingredient. And so the point there was we weren't prepared for this conversation when challenged with information, it, or when challenged with questions, you wouldn't have the information right there to be able to say, well, the reason it says that on that website is X, Y, Z. So as scientists, science lovers, et cetera, hopefully what we can appreciate about that is that it's referring to the cell line that the viruses used in the vaccine preparation are, are, um, are derived from. But if you're not there in the moment to explain that and you don't have that information right at your fingertips, it can be kind of jarring to think about that. And if you've never thought about a cell line, what it is or where it comes from, and you just read that online, what would you think that meant? Someone said there are fetal, there's fetal tissue in this. So that's the story. And that's when Sarah asked me, would you give a vaccine talk? I thought, I have a way that I want to think about this. And it came from uh, working through this case because it was very shocking, this idea of mom's question that she asked, is there fetal tissue in this? It's not exactly true, or sorry, it's not true, but it's not exactly untrue either. So there are all these kinds of little nuanced details that we have to be familiar with in order to really have a productive exchange. All right, so I wrote you a quick outline for how this talk is going to go. I, I picked my favorite grains of fruit, and then I crowdsourced some more because, as pointed out, I have I have two small kids, so I'm a member of plenty of mom groups. And one day, I was feeling very intrepid, and I put a post and said, "If you had questions about vaccines, what would they be?" And with <laughs> new comments, um, which were actually because I, you know, phrased this as I'm asking, I'm preparing to give this talk, and if you were here, what would you like me to talk about? Um, they were very lovely and productive, and so it was actually a very positive exchange, but it could have gone awry. <laughs> um, so I like the fetal tissue story. I really like this one because I have this conversation with people a lot, the idea of, well, why do we have to give so many vaccines so soon to these little babies? And there's some very good reasons for that. And there's a, a really a, a, a nice contrast that needs to be drawn with that. So we're going to get that a little bit. And then there's the, the old standbys of the Malawi and Mercury story. Um, which again, it's not really a story, but it does require context. Um, this was one that I had just talked about with my first year medical students about a month ago. And so I was really glad when um, the moms who came up with this question as well, which is babies don't need protection against a sexually transmitted infection hepatitis B. So we're going to talk about why that's not exactly the case and, and why this is you know, that it's not so simple as it seems. There's always the pharmaceutical company and the whole idea of the traditional profit. Um, and then there's the, you know, the classics, the cowboy, the monkey tissue, humor, and then finally, my child, my choice. People say that all the time. My child and what I do with my family doesn't, it's not anybody of anybody else's business. And that argument doesn't hold water when we stop and think about it. But I digress. Before we get into these again, I know I'm setting a very big stage, but I promise this is the last stage setting. Stage setting. Wow. I have a clip that I want to play a piece of for you. And it exemplifies what is not productive 
stuff in those conversations. Okay? I've seen that show. You've seen there. that show? Yeah. <laughs> I had never seen it before, actually, after that class. Oh, no. It hates me. Um, after that class session, I had. Um, You guys can see all my poems. <laughs> 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 there's, nice <laughs> there's my Twitter feed. Um, delightful. All right. The AP article. We're getting ready to submit in the ID paper. Uh, it's about mumps. Um, <laughs> I think I'm not getting it actually. Um, <laughs> Oh, where is the right one? <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay, please get this in a second. Okay, let's get to the magic point and then hopefully we can kind of come back up here. Um, the, the, the idea here, oh, yeah, never mind. Um, Okay, so we've got Jenny McCarthy, and we've got um, this gentleman, and we've got a, a gentleman in the audience. We're going to make some points about vaccines, and then we have the doctors who are going to respond, and so their response is not always super, uh, super helpful. And actually, this clip was sent to me by one of my students after that class session um, to get thoughts on it. But here we go. What's the answer? The answer is no. Molly and Ray have been COVID 25. What's the answer? The answer is one. They want to kill a couple of sick doctors. They want to identify vaccines. They want to stand on the stage and say that vaccines are autism or unrelated. There's the most bogus tobacco science. It's a small screen. If anybody who takes time to read it, what is it? It's the extra guy. They don't read the studies and don't know the details, sitting here telling parents and reassuring them that vaccines don't cause autism. And this is the biggest problem. I'm worried that the doctors in this country are frustrated. Listen, all you're doing is you're antagonizing our medical community that wants to help these kids. Okay, you're antagonizing me. You're antagonizing the doctors here. Why would they do that? This show is all about talking to the doctors. Okay, you know, it is okay. Everyone wants to blame someone, right? Yes, this is what we're, what we're trying to figure out here is how to help these kids. But all you do when you yell at me on my screen, so we saw that <laughs> let's let's hear what he's saying at the beginning now that we see how it kind of played out so listen to this That is not true, right? That is not true. That is demonstrably not true. If you go through the literature and you look, the majority of the studies were done on MMRs as requested by this community saying, this shot causes autism. Fine, so we study that shot and find no connection. But what is not mentioned in any in the title or the abstract is that often they're comparing rates and what they use as control groups were people who received hepatitis B vaccine or DTAPs or TDAPs or various other vaccines. So they were studied. You just had to read the literature and take the paper apart to be able to see that. So what he's saying is not correct. But who got the better end of that argument? He did, right? Because Dr. Bluescrubs, who name I don't know, um, <laughs> you could hear in his voice, he was angry. He sounded like he was about to break down. And he was having a hard time staying in his seat. And he was genuinely angry. And importantly, he didn't answer that question. You know, because he gets to sit there and say, how many studies have been, how many vaccines have been studied? Two, how many ingredients have been studied? One, this is also not true, by the way. We've studied all the adjuvants, oil, alum, Marisol, obviously, 
all kinds of ingredients have been studied, just never in one collective paper. So, um, but you could tell the Scrubs guy didn't know that. He didn't have that information at his fingertips. And so he's on the defensive and he winds up getting angry. If you're watching that at home, who looks like they know what they're talking about? He does. Is he correct? No, not even close. But he won the argument. And he looks like the guy who actually cares about kids. So, that's interesting. <laughs> anyway. Oh, no, I might have done it again. <laughs> we'll have to Sometimes my kids. Every time he moves. <laughs> Um, there you go. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so now we have an idea of what kind of things physicians are, are faced with when parents come and ask questions, or when you think parents might be home watching that on TV. What might they be coming away with? What impression is being made? Okay, so. Once again, here's our reminder of what we're going to talk about. Now we, at long last, are actually going to talk about them. Okay, so first up, we have vaccines contain fetal tissue. And again, this was the whole thing that got me started in thinking about discussing vaccines in this way of, we can't say, no, that's not true. We need to explain the context to people. Okay, so... Have you no decent CD power? You putting ground up fetuses into a child? Where are these fetuses coming from? It doesn't even make sense when you hear it, but that's what online. So basically, the, the big difference here is we need to be very clear about what tissue is versus what cell line is. So what tissue is what it sounds like. It's a hunk of flesh or <laughs> Your disgusting term. Um, and cell lines are primary cultured human, in this case, cells that are propagated in the laboratory. And they are incredibly divorced from the original bit of tissue that they came from. For vaccines in particular, uh, with this rumor, there are two cell lines that, that we think about, MRC5, WI38. So both of those are long fibroblast cell lines. And where this actually comes from is, I wanted to find the right diagram, but I couldn't, so I need one. Um, so bear with me, it hasn't been, hasn't been field tested yet. But um, if you had an original piece of lung tissue, uh, both of these were from uh, terminated pregnancies, one of which was terminated due to a health issue, and both of them were donated with full informed consent um, for research purposes. So you have a bit of lung tissue in 1962 and in 1966, depending on which one we're talking about, those lungs were dissected, individual cells were extracted. Yes, I know that's not a fibroblast, but you can see it really nicely. Um, <laughs> and Extracted cells are going to then divide and divide and divide and divide in the laboratory. All of those are going to be genetic clones of each other. And if you get a nice population growing, you can split that population apart and start putting them in separate dishes. And if they really adapt well to growing in the laboratory, you can freeze them down and preserve them and then distribute them. And they can grow, be grown in laboratories all over the world. So what you have today, in the present day, are millions of flasks of MRC5s and WI38s. I have MRC5s in my lab. I, I never met this fetus on. Um, it, it predates me. Uh, like, um, so subcultures of these have been replicated for decades. Um, so the cells that are used to grow a vaccine strain today are very distant descendants of that original fetal one. So, while you can't quite say that there's no fetal component, it's important to note that it, it's not quite the way it sounds, right? What, if, what is that? Is that referred to as like 
derived from fetal tissue or something? So I'm actually going to show you the language in just okay. a second, and they recently changed it for this very reason. Yeah. It originally did on the CDC vaccine information, uh, vaccine ingredient sheet, it did say fetal tissue verbatim, which is like, ooh, like that. That was not <laughs> smart. Um, so it instantly a question might come up and say, why do you need cells in order to make a vaccine? What is the point of growing human cells in a lab? What do they have to do with it? Um, and we have to remember these are um, important to viral vaccines. Viruses are not like bacteria or fungi where you can just take some off and grow them by themselves in a lab. A virus is just going to sit there and not do anything unless you give it a host cell that's going to help it replicate. So what we have here, if you want to think about it from a schematic standpoint, if you want to make a big all of fresh virus in order to produce your vaccine, you'll take a stock virus, you'll expose it to a cell. Let's pretend this cell here is either an MRC5 or a WI38. Your virus is going to attach on and it's going to replicate itself and then it's going to assemble new copies of the virus, which is going to bud out or blow the cell up and just get released. And you have fresh brand new virus. So it's also important to note here that these are what's used in a vaccine preparation. The cells are not, right? These are purified prior to them being injected into anybody. So this is this cell, even though we argue again, it's it's from a cell line, it's not tissue, but this cell is not actually in the preparation. That's a really important thing to note as well. But those are envelope viruses, right? Um so this so this diagram is, yeah, these are, this is actually an HIV diagram that I stole. I took the labels off because there is no HIV vaccine and I wanted to make sure we're all clear on that. But um, it was just a, it was a nice looking diagram to manipulate. So um, yeah, so this one here would be an envelope virus. Um, this is how, so this is completely reminiscent of how the chickenpox vaccine would look, um, how, um, the um, measles vaccine would look, so they're still going to have their envelopes on them. So theoretically, you're right in that the envelope on the virus does stem from that, that cell membrane. So if there were to be a component of it, it would be the envelope that's on the virus. So you're, you're absolutely right in pointing that out. It, it, but I do think it's important to note that the entire cell itself is not there, but the phospholipids do derive from the membrane. So, so that's why they have to say it's not just a byproduct of the manufacturing process, exactly. but it's actually the virus itself which contains remnants of the little remnants, virus. exactly. So I wanted to I don't even know if I dare open this with the projector, but basically um, we'll see what happens if we're feeling lucky. Oh, Interesting. <laughs> it never switched over. Well, I'm just going to go back here and not push my luck. So basically, um, what I linked over here is kind of a typical blog that discusses this topic, and and it's written for moms of young babies and a lot of the language is used is incredibly inflammatory and they talk about they start the piece off talking about the Planned Parenthood videos that were circulated they were demonstrably false and that, that none of the accusations that were made were, were actually reality um, that these were heavily doctored and edited videos blah 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 but at the beginning of this piece, it's now we know what they're doing with this fetal tissue that's being stolen and it's being put in these vaccines and blah, blah, blah. And it was, you know, this long of yelling about you know, all of these terrible things that were, were put in. Um, and underneath it, I like the, the um, CDC page. And I'm thinking I'll, I can put 
these links onto maybe the club's web, uh, Facebook page if anyone wants to open them up and look at them. But uh, to Walter's question, the CDC um, information sheet, uh, particularly under the uh, chicken pox vaccine, it says fetal cells are one of the ingredients. So let's say you're a new parent, you read that, and then you say, I can't possibly be. And then you check these guys, and it says right there, fetal cells. What would you think? Maybe yelling lady's right, you know? And then if you go to your physician and you ask, and your physician says, no, that's not true, or, well, I can't tell you why it's in there, but just trust me, you need this, you need this vaccine, because the physician didn't know offhand the context of what that meant, all of a sudden, that sounds legit. That sounds real. And so that's a problem. We need to make sure that we know the context when there's something that's a teensy bit true, but mostly not true. But a teensy bit true. If you flat out deny it, you look like you're lying and you have something to hide. When in actuality, it may be just you didn't know the context. So to sum that up, is there something about fetal tissues involved with certain vaccines? Yeah, there is. Is it what it sounds like? That you're grinding up fetuses and treating them in No, of course not. No. And so what's the lesson in context? That cell lines derived from terminated embryos dating back 50 years are used to grow the viruses and they are removed during preparation. And with the sole exception of the envelope phospholipids, not involved. So perhaps that would be a comfort to a parent who read the screaming angry thing, saw the CDC information, and then didn't know what to do. Maybe that would be a comforting explanation. I think that it might be. So, so you know, there's this, this controversy between um, intelligent design and evolution. And there was, um, at one point I saw this kind of like talking points. These are the arguments that the intelligent designer people, these are the arguments. And it was really, it was straightforward. And it seems like physicians should have something like that, that, you know, yes, there is fetal tissue, but it's, or not, but the it's, fetal cell, that's a other virus. Blah. Exactly, I think that would be delightful. And that was, I think, a big part of why we wanted to present that case so that our students would carry that into practice and say, oh yeah, there's a lot of things like this that are in context perfectly explainable and not alarming at all, but we have to know the context, <laughs> exactly. Um, but I think physicians did have that in their head, but all these little new arguments, every time it seems an argument is kind of Okay, well now we're going to be upset about X, Y, or Z. So it's it's almost like we were prepared for the autism conversation, but we weren't prepared for the next one. So now we're going to move on to the infamous "too much, too soon" argument, or as as I like to use as a counter example, the person who gives you more weather. Um, so this one we hear all the time. Um, hear it from other moms. I've heard it from medical students. Even. Um, why do we have to give so many vaccines when babies are so medical? And to which I say, genuinely, why, why not? And I'm not meaning that facetiously, but what is that that's kind of troubling to you? And the idea is, well, they're getting so many things at once. And to my microbiologist, we're all constantly getting so many things at once, right? We, we know that. Um, there are microbes everywhere. But I think that's not intuitive to, to lots of people. Like, you think, okay, I know technically there are invisible microbes and they're on things and blah, but just how many you interact with on a daily basis, I think most people don't have a good sense for that. And it's, it's a lot. So the idea of, well, if we give so many antigens to a baby, it's going to overwhelm their system and, and, and cause some trouble. And I, I, I really do understand that. 
So my thought on this, and, and the example that I like to give to people is, think about a time when you were at Disney World with your kid, and they're like hanging on a railing and dragging, and they get in line for an hour and a half, and you're like, why didn't you get a fast pass? You're like, it's cost extra money, and it's all the thing. And uh, so, um, basically, they've been dragging their hand on that stupid railing like every other kid in the 9,000 kids that are in line. And then they grab a handful of popcorn and put it in their mouth. And then they take, you know, a cracker and they give it to the baby. How many things were on that cracker? That kid had his hand on the railing the whole time. So basically, anytime you grab a railing in a crowded place or a door handle at an airport or anything, you're, there's just a tremendous exposure to millions of antigens. And so, the five or ten in a vaccine just pales in comparison. But you have to think about it that way. If you're not, it's not intuitive to you why, why that's not an issue. So what I wanted to do, in addition to the Disneyland railing incident, because you could always say, well, I would never let my baby touch a railing, um, which plenty of people don't, is I wanted to do some math. So it's my intuition that that is not an issue, but I, I like math, and, and I figured we could demonstrate this in a better way. And so what I did is I looked for some papers, and I actually found a very useful one. It was published in 2015, and what this paper was looking at, honestly, I can't remember why, but they wanted to know how many of certain bacteria and they, they looked at four different genera, mycobacteria, bacteria, and then two different uh, clustering clusters. How many of these bacteria were retained in dust that is found in a mattress? So these guys basically had parents collect a certain amount of dust, and then they did a quantitative PCR to see how many of these organisms were in each milligram of dust. And so, you can, and you can pull the raw data right out of the paper. So what they came up with was looking just at, again, these four organisms. There were 42,355 bacteria per milligram of mattress dust. So I thought, what if we could figure out how many, at least of these bacteria, a person would breathe in every day? You know, how does that number compare? To what's what's given in a vaccine. So I thought, all right, I'm going to be as conservative as possible. And again, we're already pretty darn conservative because we're only looking at four different organisms here. Um, so now we do newborn lung capacity. <coughs> you know, give vaccines to you know 12 hour old newborns, but we'll use that number just to be very thorough. So newborns breathe in typically half a liter of air per minute. So that means they breathe in 30 liters of air per hour which means in 24 hours, they breathe in 720 liters of air. This has a point, I promise. So if you look at the EPA limit for indoor air quality for 10 micron, that says micromolar, I apologize, it should say micron, um, dust particles, which is the size for household dust, the, the thought is there's about 150 micrograms per liter of air. So, <laughs> What that basically meant for me was I now have a liter measurement, and I have a, a uh, cells per milligram, and then a microgram per liter. So we can figure out that of these four organisms alone, there would be 108,000 micrograms, or 100 milligrams of dust in each liter of air. And that means that every day, a newborn baby breathes in 4,574,340 bacterial cells just by breathing indoors. And again, of these four organisms. Undoubtedly, that is higher. This is so dramatic. I am. I actually did the math that way. Um, and put that in perspective, I then went and looked at all of the live, um, all of the, sorry, all of the vaccines that contained actual viral particles, whether living or dead. And they are measles, rubella, hepatitis A, chicken hops, mumps, rotavirus. And 
I went to the manufacturer's page and I looked at the dosing information and I found out how many viral particles are in each dose. So for measles, it's 500, rubella, it's 500, hepatitis A, it's 720, chickenpox, 1400, mumps, 3125, rotavirus virus is around a million, and our bacteria and dust. And so then I, of course, had to make a graph because I had numbers. Um, <laughs> So if this is your organism exposure. This is what you're exposed to for measles, rubella, hepatitis A, chickenpox, mumps, rota, and breathing indoors. So the too much too soon argument, intuitively it never you know, spoke to me. But now mathematically it doesn't speak either because this is, this is clearly not an, overwhelm, uh, an overwhelming dose. Um, but where does perception come from? Sure. Um, what would your answer to somebody asking, uh, yeah, the, the vaccine you're injecting is intergenerated like in the muscle, it's not something like in contact with the mucosa. How about that? So I would actually, I would actually argue that um, these are all, with the exception of Hep A, these are all mucosal pathogens. So they're going to do you far less damage being injected in your muscle than they would contacting your mucosa. I, I don't know if, if that would speak to to um, to a person who wouldn't quite know the, about mucosal barriers and, and how that's sort of injecting the muscle. But my argument would be that those pathogens, again, um, have a notwithstanding, they want to be at your surface. Mm -hmm. And they're, if you're injecting them into muscle, they're not going to be happy there. They're not, they're, it's going to take them a long while to find an appropriate host cell to start replicating and actually causing the problems. So that would be my response, I think. But I don't know if there's there's a better one. There might be. Yeah. I'll do the blue right now. Um, but going back to, to the perception, is it true that there's more, I guess, um, vaccine injections and they are being administered early on? It, I mean, it, it, it is. As a statement of fact, is that true? So the perception was, is that a negative impact to an infant's health? In other words, like, are they being administered when they're newborn babies? Because I don't have the, I obviously won't recall it myself personally. <laughs> but I mean, there are others I remember getting, like, you know, the things injected into my arm was when I was, like, in kindergarten, I think. Yeah, so basically, the childhood schedule as it looks right now, there are more now than there used to be because there have been more discovered. So they've been added to the normal childhood vaccine recommendations. Um, as for earlier, we don't really give any to newborns. The earliest recommended vaccines are at eight weeks old. So at that point, we consider those infants at that end. So we have a series at two weeks. We have some at, oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Eight weeks, four months, six months, 12 months, 18 months. Then you have some at four years old, so that would be more or less your kindergarten memory. And then you have a lot more at um, 10, 11, 12. You get some, some boosters. So there are more vaccines than there used to be. That is a correct statement as to whether or not that adds danger to things. I don't think so. But that's and, the perception of the issue. Right. That there are more than there used to be, and we see more of X, Y, Z in the population. I wonder if those things are connected. I think you're right. I think that is a perception that people have. And it is correct to say there are more than there used to be, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's too much. It simply means we invented more stuff. <laughs> and are they concurrent? A lot of them are, yeah. So. It's, if you think about it from the standpoint of um, if we were to be additive with these. So I separated out measles, rubella, and mumps. Those all, and um, chicken pox, those now all come in one shot. It's called ProQuad. Um, but if you added these particles together, they're still nowhere near the same amount of exposure as you would get simply from doing standard daily activities. 
but there, there's still an inferential thing that you're saying, like magnitude equals impact, and that's not necessarily true either. I don't disagree, but the argument is based on argument equals uh, on, on uh, magnitude equals impact, or the source of the objection is argument equals impact. Sorry, the source <laughs> of the <laughs> objection is magnitude equals impact. So. To me, the answer would be put in the same terms. I agree with you. I don't think it does equal impact because you have, you know, it, there are certain infectious agents that you inhale, you know, 10 particles and you can get sick. There are others where you can ingest 100,000 and you, you won't. You'll be fine. So I, I, scientifically, I completely agree. Magnitude does not equal impact, but I was trying to frame the response in the same frame that, that the objections put us in. Uh, I just want to ask, I think it's people coming. Sure. But uh, for example, well, I'm new look, here, so I don't know. Lots of new vaccines are like. Um, yeah, some of you are yeah. vaccines that are not the whole virus or the whole bacteria. So actually, what you inject is specific for it has antibodies. So instead of injecting like several. Yeah, the whole organism. The whole organism with a lot of antibodies in the face, mm -hmm. and you just take one single antigen of the virus. So actually, you can vaccinate with, you know, against four different um, bats, uh, <laughs> against four different pathogens, but the antigen you usually inject is, um, the number of antigen you inject is lower in terms of right. quality. It, a whole virus is going to have thousands of different um, molecules on its surface. Some of them are proteins, some of them are sugars, some of them are lipids, doesn't matter. But the point is it's going to have thousands on one virus. If you're using a purified subunit, you're going to have one thing that you're responding to as opposed to that thousands. So I think, if I'm saying your point correctly, I, I think that even though, um, you know, if you, if you mix together 20 different subunits and just shot someone up with purified measles, even though the measles is one thing versus the 20 things mixed together, that is going to actually have a higher number of different things your immune system is responding to, even though it looks like it's less. It's sort of like holding up one dollar and a hundred pennies. And um, so, yeah, that's so not the biologist in the room. So, what you're saying is that. Within inside of those um, virus types, mm -hmm. there's composition relative to the way your body's responding to it. So in other words, like let's say um, first one would be karate chops. So there's several karate chops. You're only administering one version of it, and you're saying that's a karate chop. Next one would be a punch. The next one would be like maybe doing an upper punch, a jab, sure. or whatever. You're only administering a jab within those. Is that more correct perception? Yeah, I could see that. Well, I'm asking. I don't know. You're, you're, Bring with me, but I'm steering a conversation. So as a scientist, you shouldn't say that. <laughs> yes, I understand what you're saying. Like, yeah, it sounds right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think you've got the idea. Whereas, okay. yeah. But, I mean, but that's what I'm saying. Is like if, if I'm the number in the room, and it, if you, you explain it to people like in those terms, what? But you're not. No, I am. <laughs> no, but, and you are not. You guys are all scientists. I'm not. So like the thing of it is, is like the whole issue you're going. To back to is contextual framing of what you're trying to get across. And if people don't understand it, you know, you're saying like, oh, the, you know, the envelope of the virus and stuff like that, like that's a minutia detail, no offense, that you guys understand, you gals. Right, but no one else knows. Nah, I don't know, yeah, exactly. what, you know, Jack about that. No, I, I take your point though. So in other words, in your analogy, what would, uh, what the point would, or the nature of the question would be, yeah, you're dealing with punches, whereas the entire virus put together would be a whole mixed martial arts show. Is that, I think that's Well, uh, I was kind of how, point, a point analogy out of the narrow on the spot, like I'm just trying to figure right. this out. Yeah, no, I think, you're, I think your analogy is spot on, actually. I think that works perfectly. Mm -hmm. And okay. so you'd have a million different moves over here and only chops or punches over here, and you can if you put together a mixture of chops, punches, and uppercuts, and <laughs> kicks, and then um, 
that's how I play Arrow. Um, <laughs> then <I'm> it's, works. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I hook whatever. Um, that, that's that's even though it's a higher number of things I listed off, it's still less than full mixed martial arts. So, um, but now I take your point though. Sometimes that if we get too bogged down in minutia, we're not communicating effectively anymore, and um, that's what we want to do. So, point well taken. <laughs> I'm thinking that a weakness of the argument is that nobody's ever gotten autism from mattress dust, but plenty of people have gotten autism from vaccines, and and now there's more. That's where it sounds. <laughs> I, wait, so are you framing the argument that someone would make? Or, yeah. Yeah. So that's where it gets tricky because you have to stop and step back and saying you're working under the assumption right. that X cause Y. Right. But more mattress but, dust, that's just a benign thing. But more vaccine, that's not a benign thing. You're not proving that the vaccine is benign. In this instance, that wasn't the nature of the point, which I know is tricky because when you, you're trying to converse, ten, people tend to move the goalposts, which is tricky. The nature of the point here was, are we giving too many things to which... But it's medicine. <laughs> it's not just anything. It's not just mattress dust. It's not just mattress dust. You can yeah, probably, you know, so I think you're saying mattress dust because that's where we have like the most uh, microbes right. and various things, right? You're thinking like the most where well, that's no, I, I think so. The the he's the talk. So, but like you could yeah. probably yeah. You know, take your immune system and look at it before and after. You know, if you were looking at an antibody, uh, you know, like the the whole thing you go through an allergen since they you know injected with all these different allergens. Um, but like you could probably take it before and after exposure to ma uh, mattress dust and before and after exposure to a vaccine, and you're going to see basic Similar levels of inflammation and response, right? Um, and I, it's, yeah. Or, but I, I take your point, and I think it's actually uh, speak, spoken to in my little picture about where does this perception come from. And so the idea is people have this idea you can take too much medicine. And you can for pharmaceuticals, these are biological, so it's different. But, um, but the, the point being is someone would say, I see household dust every day. It doesn't bother me. Right. Why are you even talking about that? And to me, this perception of difference is people don't think about all of these things they're being exposed to because they intuitively know they're safe. You see them every day, right? Whereas this, you don't see that every day. And that, that looks dangerous. And the other thing is, in a, I can say this as a person who has had babies and had to hand them over to somebody who's going to hold them down and stick a needle in them and it's going to make them cry and it's going to give them a fever and it's going to be terrible and if you're a first time mom when someone takes your baby away to stab them with a needle and you know they're going to cry it's devastating <laughs> and it's and i have every confidence that if they're safe and they're effective but it's still hard i was with you know, subsequent babies on the end, there you go. But um, <laughs> the first one, it, it's very hard. It, it, it's jarring and wretched. So when you read these very suggestive things, you think about this, and you don't think about the dust in the mattress. <laughs> Even though your immune system, if you pulled out a blood panel, it would be doing the exact same thing at the same level. So I think it's a familiarity versus non-issue, and a primal, don't stab my baby with a sharp thing. And, and I'm, I'm genuinely, I, you know, I'm trying to be a little funny, but it, I'm genuinely not trying to disrespect that feeling. It's very real. It's very, very real. I promise. <laughs> um, all right, so that's my too much too soon story. These do get faster, I promise. Um, so formaldehyde and mercury, these have been discussed so many times, on so many levels. So I, I almost, um, you know, am again not going to spend a lot of time on them, but basically we hear all the time, there's formaldehyde in vaccines and there's mercury in vaccines and those are poisons. 
and we shouldn't be injecting poison into our body. And, yeah, they are poisonous if you inject a whole lot of them. Um, you know, formaldehyde is what you use through a kid washer. It's not good. Um, mercury is very toxic. But the dose makes the poison, right? And so everybody has probably heard ad nauseum, like you can die from drinking too much water in too short a time. So it, it doesn't make water poisonous. It makes it good for you, but just don't drink six liters in an hour or bad things will happen to you. Um, so for me, I think one of the things that's important to discuss about these is why they're present. Because people think about this as, well, why in the world would that possibly be in there? That, that cannot be good. Why would you want to have that anywhere near a baby? And so here's why, because they're poisonous, right? Or so speaking first about formaldehyde, yeah, it's there because it's poisonous. You have a live virus, that's this one. Okay. You have a live virus. <laughs> you do a montage of PowerPoint shapes and make it green, and that's how you draw a virus. Um, and you give it formaldehyde, and it becomes a death virus. And dead viruses are good, because live viruses, when you shoot them into people, sometimes you get dead people, and then that's a problem. So, because nobody likes dead people hanging around your office. Anyway, um, so we had dead virus plus formaldehyde. All right, great. So you wash it and you purify it, and now you have pure, clean, dead virus, and you have formaldehyde, and you're washed away. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you have pure, clean, dead virus. Uh oh, wrong direction. What is happening right now? Sorry. Sorry about that. Pure clean dead virus. And you give that to some dude, and then you have it in the Come on. <laughs> Maybe slightly more complicated than that, but that's the general idea. Um, so basically, yeah, if we don't have an attenuated vaccine strain, so a strain, a strain that's so weakened it can't cause disease anymore then we have to kill it first. Because if you don't, there's dead people in your office. That's bad. Um, you still have horns and whatnot. You want to deal with that. So anyway, next, are vaccines formaldehyde free? Essentially, not entirely. Because when you do that purification process, you remove 99.99999999% of the formaldehyde. But you can't guarantee there's not like three little atoms in there. Sorry, molecules. I'm not a chemist. Um, but for context, this is everyone's favorite uh, formaldehyde example. There's more naturally occurring formaldehyde in a pear than there is in a vaccine. So, unless you're worried about big pears conspiracy to make us all less smart, I don't think that we need to worry about this. Big pear. Um, no. <laughs> there is an actual organization called USA Pears, by the way, which I learned about. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> don't explain why the pear industry lobby. <laughs> I, I don't have a pharmaceutical contract, but I am in the pocket of big pear. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's formaldehyde. Yeah, it's there, it's related, but we're not shooting people up with big perfusions of formaldehyde. So I'm at work here. Okay, so the first thing we have to talk about is nobody shoots atomic mercury into anybody because that's incredibly unstable and dangerous and just bad things happen. So mercury is almost always stabilized with either a methyl group or an ethyl group, probably. or sorry, a methyl group or two methyl groups, which would be an ethyl. Anyway, again, not a chemist. Um, so what we have to do here is we tend to colloquially, just commonly use mercury as a term, 
But those two components, ethyl mercury versus methyl mercury, they have incredibly different bio properties. Um, methyl mercury is very bad. It very readily crosses the blood brain barrier. This is the kind that you see in, um, in a high food chain predator fish. So it's the reason why we're told not to swordfish more than once a month, which is a bummer because I love swordfish, but that's probably more than you all wanted to know. Um, but that's the one that we hear all the bad mercury stuff about. Ethyl mercury is um, far less penetrative to the blood brain barrier. I don't want to say it's completely non penetrative because that's not correct. Um, but it takes a very, very long time for a very, very small amount to get past the blood brain barrier. And I'll tell you more about this in a second. Um, it actually is a biologically irrelevant amount that you're exposed to in medicine. So why is this there? So we learned about the formaldehyde with the dead things and whatnot. Ethyl mercury, the trade name which was thimerosal, is a is a preservative. So I put why was it there? Um, there are very few vaccines that still have thimerosal in them because a lot of people were very upset about this, saying, why are you shooting mercury to babies? Um, again, bearing in mind the ethyl ethyl difference, but so vaccine manufacturers responded to their customers, basically, and said, all right, we'll take that out. But why was it there? Um, it was there as a preservative to prevent bacterial and fungal growth. I'll show you in a second why that, why that matters. So vaccine doses used to be, in school, they, they were kind of dated. But um, so historically, vaccines were prepared in these big multi-dose dose vials. And when those were, um, when a syringe would go into those and some would be drawn out, there was always the potential that you could introduce bacteria or fungal spores into the vial, which would be bad for the next person. So this was added, and aerosol was added as a preservative to prevent that from happening. Um, having those multi-dose vials kept the cost very low because you didn't have to manufacture an individual vial for each person getting a shot. You could put 100 doses into one, much cheaper. Um, so, but it was taken out. We now do mostly single dose vials. Why was it there? If it wasn't there, if there were no preservatives in that vial and there, were, there was a little bit of bacterial contamination, you can get things like cellulitis at the injection site. So you have a nice big staph infection, which is not good, very painful, can become invasive, people can die, not good. People can lose limbs, everything else. Um, additionally, introduction of fungal spores into, into the injection would have been very bad. And I want to just call attention to something that happened in um, 2012, which was a compounding pharmacy, unfortunately, from my neck of the woods, um, the New England <laughs> compounding pharmacy, um, was producing vials of, of uh, a uh, steroid. And these were given as an epidermal epidural injection into people's spines. And it turned out they were not using appropriate sterile technique and preservatives, and a whole bunch of people got fungi injected into their spinal cord, and a whole lot of people got fungal meningitis from that. And the, the, the uh, pharmacy executive who was in charge of this, because he was using some standard procedures, was actually convicted um, in that outbreak. So, we take the idea of what we inject into people and its sterility very, very seriously for, for very good reasons. So that was why thimerosal was there. It was used to prevent all of this. But now, again, we move mostly to single dose vials. The downside of that costs a lot more money. So what used to be a very cheap preventative measure is a little bit more expensive than it used to be. But that being said, um, the other thing I want to briefly bring up was did anybody hear about this? No. This this was an uh, did you? Oh, sure. Any plans to find an alternative to the thimerosal? Yeah. So some people. To 
thought along those lines initially, and um, and in particular, it was important because in the U.S. we had this idea of well, we'll just raise the price, and so and then very much the same thing happened in, in Europe where people want to steal those files. In developing countries, that is a catastrophic change in price, um, and so the idea is, can we keep thimerous all in those? Preparations that are going to go to other countries, or can you find a different alternative? So the thought was, at least in the U.S., it was almost easier to just produce single dose vials because then you wouldn't have to go through trials of having a new add additive in the mix. Um, but I think it's an important point because that much of a change in price, it doesn't matter so much in the U.S. It's more of a nuisance. But it matters a great deal in other parts of the world. So you heard the president. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, somebody about that idea. Um, <laughs> so did anyone hear about this? The RFK Jr. and Robert De Niro tag team advert. So basically, back in February, um, these unlikely Pals here um, issued a challenge, and it read as such: We will pay hundred thousand dollars to the first journalist or other individual who can point to a peer-reviewed scientific study demonstrating that thimerosal is safe in the amounts contained in vaccines currently being administered to American children and pregnant women. Asterisk: The levels are 25 micrograms ethyl mercury per dose of flu vaccine administered to pregnant women and children following CDC ACFP guidelines. So. Technically, they're not wrong. There is no study that specifically says that. However, I of course wrote up a three-page submission for <laughs> <laughs> anything but um, because I'm me and that's the kind of shenanigans I pull. Basically, much as with the dust study, I went and grabbed a bunch of papers and said, you know, my first thought was, it can't possibly be right. So I went to PubMed and I went, after about an hour, I said, you know what? I think they're technically correct. Nobody did that study exactly as they ordered it. But as per usual, the data exists. They're just spread in three or four different studies. And you just have to put them together into one thing and say, yes, this is safe. So basically, what we found is there's, or so what I found when I looked through, is there's several papers showing that if you um, look at rates of children with neurodegenerative disorders and who received, um, in, in this one particular paper, they were talking about the hepatitis B vaccine, um, and what dose of mercury was associated with that. Um, rates where you had completely equivalent to background, fell in the 25 microgram range. And at higher than that, you actually did start to see elevated rates of, of, um, of neurological diagnoses in children. But at the biologically relevant rate, uh, sorry, biologically relevant level of ethyl mercury, there was no difference to controls. So, fine. So I, I, I referenced that study and I said, Recognize this was done with hepatitis B, but since your objection is ethyl mercury, it should not matter what that was compounded with. Um, and then after that, we went on to show some, you know, we found some papers where they looked directly at neurons in uh, cell culture dishes. They were looking at neuron toxicity, and basically they they did exposures of ethyl mercury and looked at the time until you started to see cellular degeneration and, and negative effects. And it turned out that they went through and they did a titration and they found that um, at a certain level of, um, of ethyl mercury, you were going to see toxicity after a certain number of hours. That level was much higher than 25 micrograms. And that number of hours was not very huge. So, I then went and said, what is the half-life of ethyl mercury in a human body? How long, in other words, if somebody shoots you up with that, how long does it stay in your body? So I went and found that number, 
And that number was much higher than this number. So what I needed was to come up with a mathematical relationship between this and this. So we come up with a nice, um, again, I, I have it queued up, but I'm kind of nervous about switching this again. Um, we came up with this nice, beautiful mathematical relationship. Very nice, r squared value. And it, it turns out that um, you would see toxicity in neurons from methylmercury after 72 days in a human body. Fortunately, the half-life, or, or sorry, fortunately, the half-life in a human body is such that all of it should be gone from you in 22 days. So, both epidemiologically and by cell biology, I think the data do exist that show that is perfectly safe, but it's just from like three different papers. So I just had to put it together and do a little math. So that was my submission, but again, haven't gotten my hundred grand yet. So, but technically speaking, they're not wrong, which is really frustrating. <laughs> Anyway, so that's the mercury formaldehyde story. The next one I want to talk about is the my baby doesn't need a hepatitis B vaccine because she is not a sexually active drug user, at least I hope not. Um, so there's two really important reasons why infants receive the hepatitis B vaccine. Never mind that this is, as mentioned, a subunit vaccine, so it's very biologically inert, it's very safe. But there's two really solid reasons why. First of all, you think of hepatitis B as an STI, but it's it's really a bloodborne pathogen spread by blood and body fluids. That includes breast milk, that includes saliva, that includes blood tinged saliva, such as you might find from a nine-month-old kid who's gnawing on their because their molars are coming in and then they go and grab a toy and then some other kid goes and grabs that same toy and gnaws on their molars. Anyways, um, the point being, there's plenty of opportunity for exchange of body fluids among small children in daycare settings. And in fact, there have been plenty of papers about that where you can see transmission. Prior to that, the vaccine being released, you could see transmission of hepatitis B in daycare. So it actually is not irrelevant at all, even though we tend to think of it as an STI. Um, in addition to that, uh, how does it get a daycare ecosystem in the first place? It is, can be vertically transmitted from mother to baby. So um, again, either during birth or via birth. So that's an issue. But again, hepatitis isn't that bad an illness, right? So why do we need to do this? So hepatitis B is particularly bad for babies, or, or for young children. Um, so like all hep viruses, it causes acute hepatitis initially, which is you feel pretty junky for three or four weeks. You might get a little bit of jaundice, um, you might get a low grade fever, maybe some belly pain, but ultimately, usually it's going to resolve and you're going to be fine. Um, most of the time for adults, you suffer through acute hepatitis, and then you resolve your infection 90% of the time. 10% of the time, adults develop what's called chronic infection, meaning they never get, they get over this acute phase, but then they still carry the virus. And ultimately, what ends up happening to those patients is they develop cirrhosis of the liver, because they have this virus that keeps replicating, and your immune system keeps trying to go in and get rid of it, so you wind up with all I'm pointing on the entire wrong side of my body, sorry. I just had to go with that's not a liver, okay? That's, anyway, um, so you wind up with all the scarring on your liver, and that's what it looks like when you take it out of somebody. Um, in addition to that, either this can happen without that, or cirrhosis can progress to liver cancer. And so that's bad, right? So if you're an adult, you've got a 10% chance of this happening, which is no good. If you are a child under the age of five and you are infected with hepatitis B, you have an 85% chance of this happening and only a 15% chance of resolving. So that's bad. <laughs> we may not see a lot of babies with hepatitis B, but the ones we do see, have a really, really hard road ahead of them because 
85% of the time, this is going to happen, they're going to need a liver transplant. And, you know, transplant patients, it's not like you go in, it's not like knee replacement surgery, right? Like you go in, you do your rehab, and then you're better. You know, transplant patients have a lifelong medical situation that is going to need medication and immune suppression for the rest of their life. So that's bad. We don't want that. So that's why your baby needs to have a hep B vaccine, even though she's not a sexually active drug user. <laughs> At least we hope. Anyway, yes. So uh, again, I'm not biased. <laughs> Does administering the vaccine totally um, what's the word? Offset. It's not offset. There's, there's a Does it effect on the word. Completely protect. Yeah, well, I guess it you know, inhibits a baby from getting this. Yeah, so it's Don't actually going to... So then this goes back see. to the last point you're going to have, not my baby, my child, my choice, because you're pulling the, the, the crowd. So you're saying, like, the argument is this, like, you know, my my, you're like, my, my kid's not a drug user, but there's a vertical transmission thing. Right. So the vertical transmission is going to have happen maybe potentially with a person who hasn't had this, they're injected into a crowd of people that may not have it. Right. So So actually this this kind of like goes into your other argument as well, right? More or less. I, yeah, I might be I might I think I'm missing a link here. Um but well, so we, so they, saying, well, when, the potential I guess um, factor mechanism can be vertical you're saying. Right. So vertical means from mother to child. Right. right. So, so I don't think like I've had a hepatitis shot. Right. Probably not. Um, but then but the flip side of that is that a lot of maybe um, mothers now may not have that either. They may have gotten it through whatever, maybe like a tattoo or something like that. Is that correct? Uh, mostly it's hepatitis C, you see, with tattoo okay. needles, but so they could yeah, get their, their the child didn't have the yeah. vaccine, Correct. and their child is playing with other kids right. who may or may not have had their vaccine. Right, exactly. So that's why I think it's so important to talk about this, because I think you have somebody saying, well, I don't want my baby to get that, but you don't know. Right. Your baby is, is, is has potential to be exposed. And I think people make this make this decision about this vaccine thinking there's no way their baby could possibly be exposed to hepatitis B. And I think that's not correct. I think it's 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 quite possible. Um, so the vaccine is actually is quite effective. We don't like to say that a vaccine is completely universally effective and no one will ever get it. I mean, the closest you probably come to that is a smallpox vaccine, but um, this would ultimately be to create a smallpox. But um, hepatitis B is, is a very, very effective vaccine. It's, a, it's probably about 97% effective. So if you, out of 97 people who get it, uh, sorry, out of 100 people who get it, 97 of them are going to be completely protected. And so we really like to see that um, because I think this, there's an extreme danger to young children, but also people think there's no way their baby can be exposed, and that's just not true. So, in any event, so that's my hepatitis B story. <laughs> so, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just have two little graphs to show you. So, people sometimes argue. You know, this is just the pharmaceutical company trying to make money, and that's why these are required. We don't actually need these. And um, I, every time we talk about this, everyone says, you're a shill. Well, I would drive a much better car. <laughs> anyway, I assume, I guess they get paid well. Huh? Um, so basically, this is, um, this is a, an economic breakdown of annual profits from vaccines in the United States. So um, these are billions of dollars. So annual revenues are about $24 billion, which sounds like a lot, but when you take all of these various things out, um, it's actually two and a half billion dollars, which is, sounds like a lot to me, but I recognize to a company is, is, is not very much. Um, and that's 
all vaccines sold in the United States. So that's spread over several companies, blah, blah, blah. What I want to juxtapose that number with is, is this, um, which is the economic burden associated with vaccine preventable diseases. So um, that's a total US burden, that's total um, developed world burden. So in other words, these are costs that were very easily preventable by higher vaccine coverages. So to me, it kind of looks like um, if you want to be angry at amounts of money changing and to be more angry at the hospital, and if they were really evil and wanted to sell things, they would not make vaccines, they would make drugs because then they could sell more drugs. Is, is um, that data from like OECD or what, where's that kind of, where did you get that kind of data? So that was, um, Do you remember? yeah, from OECD. Uh -huh. okay. So that was that. It was put together very nicely in a single article, which was very convenient for me. So the argument that I we, I always say to this is vaccines are not particularly profitable, actually. And a lot of companies have shut down their divisions for them because they're not profitable. Um, so there you go. All right, cow blood monkey organs, this is a quick one. Um, <laughs> I think I was gonna say that sentence today, but there you go. Um, this goes back to that idea of growing viruses in cell culture that we talked about with the fetal cells and fetal tissue uh, idea. Same deal for the monkey organs. Um, this is just a, simply a different cell line used to grow different vaccines. It's the exact same principle that's being applied here. The monkey organs are referred to BGMK cells and or Vero cells. They're both cell lines derived from uh, two different um, species of monkey. Um, so, as before, we were talking with the fetal tissue, the cells themselves, with the exception of perhaps small components, are not actually in the preparation. They're just used to generate the new viruses. Uh, the cowboy is um, fetal bovine serum. So, this right here is a bottle of what we call cell culture medium. So, if you want to grow these cells in a laboratory, you have to use a special broth to do it. And a component of that broth is fetal bovine syrup, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, fetal calves are taken out of mom and it's the same thing they do, which is be polite to them. No, sorry. Um, <laughs> which is the polite term for removing all of their blood. And the serum is taken and used as a supplement media. So uh, that's the cow blood, it's not actually cow blood, it's used in the medium to grow the cells, which again are not in the final preparation. So this is really the same argument as the fetal tissue. Alright, and then finally, my child, my choice. This is I need my last slide, except we um, So for me, here's the thing about that. It's not your child and your choice. If you are lucky enough to have a healthy child, you A, owe them the best medical protection you can give, and B, not everyone is so lucky, right? So there are a lot of medically fragile children that for one reason or another cannot get vaccinated for things. They may be allergic to some of the components. Uh, they may have a dysfunctional immune system. They may be a cancer patient on chemo. It's, it's not just about your kid. The other thing here is we talk about medically fragile children and people say, well, how many of them are, are there? You know, are there any in my community? I've never met one in my neighborhood, so it's a problem. This is a problem. And I had a very like rather personal experience with this. Young infants are the problem. Because there are plenty of them in most of our neighborhoods. So, quick story. Um, in 2013, there was a measles outbreak in the Northeast, here in California, and there were several in California as well, um, primarily in unvaccinated individuals. 
And there were cases in New York City and in Boston and various other points in between in Hartford and everywhere else. Um, so this article is from the Boston Globe. It was published September 29th, 2013. So it's September 26th, 2013, this happened. So that's that's my baby, William. And I go home from the hospital with this new baby, and, and this happens. There's measles cases in Boston. And that's 60 miles from where I live. And my husband worked at worked at Harvard at the time, and he rode the commuter rail every single day. And the first thing he did when he came home was pick the tiny baby up. He was an unbelievably contagious virus, and so all I could think was, he's going to get the measles because he's on public transit. He's like a minute old. He has barely any immune system, and he's going to get the measles. Fortunately, that did not happen, but I was lucky, and he very easily could have. And to our newborn baby, measles is not a trivial virus. It, it's a very, very severe infection. It's not a trivial virus to anyone, actually. Um, however, other people have not been so lucky. Um, I was actually a, a few years ago very um, fortunate to, to connect with um, with this woman right here via Facebook. I saw her on CNN, her name is Katie, um, and she was talking about her daughter, Callie, who is, was her first baby. Um, Callie was 38 days old and she had a cough and she went downhill very quickly and it turned out after she had passed away, 38 days old, they learned she had a pertussis. They got the diagnosis after she was already passed. So that's devastating. But what Katie has done is she has used this as an incredible inspiration to talk about childhood vaccinations because she is painfully aware that Newborn babies rely on the entire community to keep them safe from vaccine preventable infection. And in fact, she was um, she was given an award by the CDC. She was given a Childhood Immunization Champion Award in 2015. Um, I saw her on CNN. I was writing an article about vaccines at the time, and I um, like a total creeper, uh, found her on Facebook and I sent her a note and asked her if I could talk about <coughs> it in, in my article. And she was very kind and she wrote back and said, sure, please do. Um, the more people who talk about Cali and um, and their organization, which they call Cali Cares, uh, the, the better. And so, yeah, now we're Facebook friends and we chat. But anyway, the point is, um, this, this is not an abstract thing, and this really happens to people. And so every time someone says, well, it's my child, and what I do with my child is none of your business, it just makes my skin crawl, because that is not true. Um, and with measles, we, we can't vaccinate until one, one year. One year old, so it's exactly. Weird. So you have a full year waiting for Exactly. It. And one year is only the prime. They're right. not fully covered until 18 months. Right. So it's um, terrifying. It is terrifying. <laughs> it's very terrifying. And <laughs> so there, there's a community health angle to this. But the other angle is, um, you know, in the clinical world, there's nothing sadder than talking to somebody who's been in the PICU taking care of a kid who's six years old and in the PICU with pertussis because it's totally preventable and their parents are heartbroken because their parents thought they were making a healthy choice by not getting the vaccine. And now their parents have to live with the fact that they're looking at their kid in the PICU, their kid might die, their kid will never have normal lung function after that. And it was, didn't have to happen. It was totally, it was preventable. 
So the other reason why I really like to talk about this is because it's important that we help people make informed choices that they aren't going to regret. So that is my spiel. <laughs> so I want to thank Sarah and Tom who tolerated my very vaguely interesting company on the way back from the airport and Sarah invited me here and Tom bought me a meatball sub so that was awesome. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and I want to thank uh, Mary Margulies who introduced Sarah and I, um, my, my uh, colleague Kat Brent, and also uh, the swearing and sharing moms on Facebook <laughs> because that was the group that I posed my question to, what would you want answered, what are some things you've heard. And uh, I think we kept the discussion very simple in, in that group. So <laughs> thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> happy to take any more questions. Um, do you know if the government or any government is giving any incentive to companies to develop vaccines for rare diseases? I wish it would. So it's, there's, um, it's interesting you bring that up because it, it makes me think of this is about um, slightly tangential but related. Um, the World Health Organization just really the uh, excuse me, I apologize. Getting late. Um, the UN General Assembly just released a declaration um, the, this past winter um, urging. Western countries to ramp up their support for innovation in biomedical science as it applies to antibiotic resistance. Um, mixed in there was this idea of we're including vaccines in that because if you constantly give antibiotics for X bacterial disease, we don't need to do that if we can create a vaccine. And the other urging from the General Assembly was you guys as a government need you as as governments need to support these endeavors. And you need to urge your companies to produce them at cost or off patent so that everyone in the world can access these medications. Things like antibiotic resistance, and I know again that's a little a feel of the point. But um, things like antibiotic resistance, they're not somebody in India's problem. They're all of our problem, you know, because these things can jump, you know, a person can jump on a plane and come here and land in an ICU here, and then all of a sudden we have the same strain. And so these are very, very universal issues. And so that to me is the most recent big initiative that I can, that I can point to. Unfortunately, it's the UN and they don't really have the authority to do anything other than to say you need to do this. Um, it was very meaningful because it's only the fourth time in the organization's entire history they've issued a declaration on a health topic. Um, before that it was uh, Ebola and before that it uh, was um, chronic diseases, diabetes, etc. And um, before that it was HIV it was the first one. And so their declaration on Ebola included vaccine research. But um, in terms of rare diseases and emerging diseases and tropical medicines kind of interest in mind, I wish there were more programs that did. Um, it's also something that it gets a little dicey because there's trade restrictions and patent restrictions and then there's, um, when we were, not to get too much of a tangent, but when we were talking in the US about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, one of the issues that people in, in my world talked about almost constantly was, oh no, all of the medications, virtually all of the medications we use in the developing world are made off patent by Indian pharmaceutical companies. And all of a sudden, all of that would get mixed. And that sounds like an okay thing until you stop and think about it. Well, 
they're making these medications for pennies. That's what's treating most of the world. If we start making them here and trying to ship them and sell, they're gonna, it's gonna kajillionify the cost, and then you're gonna have people who can't get medication and leave. And so that was um, the reason I bring it up is because all of those little parameters that we as scientists don't necessarily ever think about. Um, you know, I certainly didn't until I started writing and, and um, kind of talking a little bit more in terms of outreach. There, there's all of these kind of international patent restrictions and manufacturing laws that come into play and would have to be part of a bigger agreement, I think. And then that gets dicey. <laughs> I know I did not in any way give you a good answer, but <laughs> see, I told you I did. Well, that was the first thing I said. <laughs> I hope I didn't disappoint. <laughs> Sorry. Did you have one more? I have two, actually. Excellent. So, for the, when you were saying that the measles outbreak um, was acquired by, I guess, by children who didn't have their vaccinations. And so, some adolescents and a few adults, but most primarily was unvaccinated people. So, on that issue that I had two questions, one was, um, is there a way of like taking a blood test or a saliva test to determine the absence of, I guess, the uh, antigens? So uh, antibodies, yes. Antibodies. Yep. That indicates that they didn't receive it, or is it an administrative check? I mean, like you have records that demonstrate that you did or did not receive these vaccinations. In other words, is it, did, you know, uh, I guess an in-band test, I meaning like you can check the person's body mm -hmm. to determine that, or is it out-band and you need paperwork to prove or disprove that? You can do either, actually. So a lot of um, a lot of places um, that require immunization. So college campuses are a big one, and um, people who want to be employed by a hospital is another big one, or a nursing home, or something in healthcare, and uh, teachers as well. Um, that's part of your job application and hiring process is that you either, you have to do one of those two things. You have to produce documentation that shows that you were vaccinated at the appropriate intervals, um, or, because I was vaccinated, I, God knows where those papers are. Um, so, <laughs> um, so what I did when I was um, applying to, to go kind of visiting in some hospitals and doing some work there, and um, when I went to college too, I had to go and get um, blood drawn to show evidence that I had antibodies against measles and mumps and rubella and chickenpox. And that showing that I had those antibodies was sufficient evidence that I'd been vaccinated. Although in my case, I didn't get vaccinated for chickenpox, I just had the disease because um, I'm old. Anyway, um, yeah, so both of those are acceptable and there are certain occupations that it's essential you demonstrate that you had that done. So the other thing is, if, and I, I don't know, was needles eradicated? And so then, how did it be flare up? It was never eradicated. That was the that was the issue. So measles, um, like smallpox, measles doesn't have any non-human host. So once you get rid of all the human cases, it should theoretically never come back. But we've never gotten rid of all the human cases. And so when and rates of vaccination in the U.S. started dropping, the minute somebody brought it back from somewhere else, you would see it appear in these unvaccinated populations again. And so that's how it flared up again, is that it never quite went away the first time. So can you do um, what would be the etymology? Marker, like the oh, epidemiological of marker? Is that what it is? So yeah. in other words, like you, know, like you go to Ancestry and go, like, we can predict the people in Italy or yeah, exactly. Germany or whatever. Yes, so you do that. Can, can you do the same thing, like, yeah. oh, one of us flared up? Because now we notice that this came from, I don't know, you know, some place. Like, yeah, you know, it came from Poland or wherever. Yeah. Wherever. Um, that's Poland. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I made it up on the air. I hope that's a camera and I look like a weirdo right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, yes, you can do that. So, um, you can sequence all of the genes in any virus isolate. It's quite cheap and easy to do that these days. 
Um, and yeah, if you have a population that had no measles, uh, you know, no cases in the entire state, for example, and then all of a sudden had a thousand cases, you would definitely do that. You would um, you would have the state epidemiologist taking samples and working uh, within their own lab or with the federal CDC. They would probably sequence that and say, yeah, this has certain just like Ancestry.com would, this has certain genetic signatures that are telling me it's exactly like this type that is circulating, and since I've already attended them, we'll say Poland. Um, so, yeah, you absolutely can do that. So is that done for the cases you're saying in New England and California? Do you know? So, I mean, you seem to be into this, which I'm not. <laughs> I've just had these beer arguments with people about vaccination. <laughs> That's why I'm here. I'm so <laughs> into it, actually. Um, so... Actually, they didn't really need to for those. And the reason was there was clear epidemiological links. Like, so they went and talked to the patients and they were able to trace the story back from how these things came to the East Coast from the West Coast where they had circulating strains. They were able to piece it together by just conversing with the patients. So originally the um, 2013 outbreak in California, I think started when um, a family had vacationed in Europe, came back, and then the, the, I think mean, his daughter got sick, and then a bunch of her classmates, and then all these people had traveled to Disneyland, and then, sorry, actually, now I'm mixing that with the 2015 outbreak. In 2015, all these people went to Disneyland, and then the stupid hand railing thing again, then everybody got infected, and then those people went back to their parts of the country, and but all of that was pieced together with patient interviews. So old school epidemiology. Is the coverage for in terms of when you get vaccinated for measles, is it still pretty low? I remember it being like eighty five percent or something low in terms of how many people are actually uh, produce antibodies enough that they won't get infected. So are we talking about Vaccine efficacy yes, or what's the what's yeah. herd threshold? Yeah. I wanted to make sure I think he limited I, the jargon when I was saying <laughs> I think it's, I think you're right, it's lower than average. I don't think it's quite that low, oh, okay. but I think it's, it's definitely lower than a lot of them. I don't, I want to say it's like 91% of them. Right. It might be. So that's the fear of you might have gotten vaccinated, but you, but you might. have no clue if you are that oddball that isn't going to be covered. <laughs> Exactly. Um, so you, you might end up with people so you, you know, it'd be very unlucky, but it could happen. It could. And it's it's one of those things, too, that if everybody in the population is vaccinated, that doesn't matter because the oddball is going to be protected because there's so there's yes. so few susceptible hosts in the population that it's not, it's very unlikely to ever spread to the oddball. No offense to any non-zero <laughs> converters in the crowd. Um, but Basically, yeah, when we've got so much voluntary um, omission of vaccines, then all of a sudden that starts mattering a great deal. Um, and then one other thing that I think is important to point out, and I, I forgot because we got talking about dust and how it's not the same as medicine. Um, <laughs> um, basically, it became um, clear when we're having these too much too soon conversations, that a lot of people will say, well, why would you risk that? Why not give to space them out? And intuitively, there's not anything wrong with that per se. That's not going to hurt. It, I don't think it's going to help anything, but it's not necessarily going to hurt unless you stop and think about the fact that you're leaving a child susceptible to preventable infections that much longer. So as a general rule, I wouldn't recommend it because I think that's riskier than, there's no added benefit to doing that. And I think you are adding a risk. But that being said, if it's really critically important to somebody, it's, not, it, it's, it's, a, it's among the most, um, it can be a compromise, I guess would be a, a good way of looking at it is that if, if somebody is really, truly uncomfortable, then go for it, you know? As long as they are properly understanding the risk that they're taking, then fine. So we've been dealing mostly with vaccinating young, young parents. 
Yeah, and now, at my age, I'm being, there's a lot of vaccination being promoted to somebody my age. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to think about each one of these sort of vaccinations that a doctor asked me, you know, uh, if I travel overseas, I got the hep B because they wouldn't let me go otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I tried to think about shingles or some other or flu, 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 or flu yeah. or whatever. So, you know, how, how does, you know, how do we think about that differently? Or do we think about it differently? Because I'm an organism that's gone so far. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure each of these is a different case depending on what the vaccine is. Right. But I think it depends on what the vaccine is, mm -hmm. what your personal risk factors are, mm -hmm. and what the outcome would be for you as an individual if you contracted that disease. Mm -hmm. It's harder to make blanket statements yeah. um, when you're dealing with an older population as opposed to when you're dealing with a childhood series. And the reason for that is, as you point out, everybody's had a very different trajectory to get to their point in life. And so there's always this argument about um, vaccinating, say, someone who's on chemo. Would you give them a flu shot, a killed flu shot? Absolutely, because it's not going to hurt them. And if they got the flu, that will kill them, um, given their health status. Pneumovax, same thing. It's it's one of these subunit ones that, that was discussed. So it's just purified, um, it's it's purified uh, capsule from the bacterial cells. So there's nothing alive in there. It's just a, a an inert biological substance. And getting strep pneumonia pneumonia will kill you if you are on chemo. Then on the other hand, if you think about the shingles vaccine. That's a live replicating virus. That, not a good idea for a chemo patient. Their risk of getting shingles and the consequence of them getting shingles is so much less dire than the other two. So it really is, for, for older population, it really becomes almost an individual consultation for each patient because you have to really look at somebody's history and what their general health status is, what other medications they're on. Um, and it, on the other hand, if you had somebody who had a perfectly intact, healthy immune system, um, but had a history of opioid abuse, there is no way you would let them walk out of their office without getting a shingles vaccine. Because I'm not giving you anything painful just in case you might go and, and take opioid pain drugs again. So, and your immune system is fine, you can handle a live replicating virus. So, it's really much more individual in that regard. But the safety remains more or less the same, provided we're not dealing with someone who we know has a compromised immune system. Yeah. No, no, is that right? So, I might give you ammo for your next beer argument. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just to combine two things we, we had about the pharma and the developing world of vaccines that we're using to produce media. Is that is that true? So like most of the So not uh, not necessarily vaccines, although a lot of them are. Um, mostly the uh, medications, the antibiotics, um, painkillers, antiretrovirals. Um, so almost all of the antiretroviral um, so AIDS drugs programs that are used in Africa, those drugs are all made. They're not, even though they were invented usually by U.S. or European companies, they're not made there. They're made in Seattle, yeah, Pat. So most, so most of the um, vaccines are administered to infants, children, teenagers. In this country, <laughs> mm -hmm. are made in this country. Correct. Yes. All. A few are made in Europe, actually. There's, there's a couple of um, flu shot preparations in particular that are made by British companies, but by and large. Amazing. So the folks out of sorry, I'm just <laughs> one of these things, these guys are gonna lock me out of this. <laughs> the, um, so the, are the quality controls any different for vaccines than are for any other pharmaceutical made items? In the US? 
I would argue they're actually I would argue they're actually in many ways more stringent. So the clinical trials are set up very much the same way. You have to have the same levels of first demonstrating that something's safe, then set demonstrating that something's both safe and effective, and then demonstrating something is safe, effective, and there are no side effects that might appear five years down the road. Um, so both medications and vaccines are held to those same standards. The vaccines, I think there's there's additional levels of quality control that go into that because you're in many cases dealing with these vials and these preparations that have to be sterile. And so there's there's a lot more QC that goes into that, I think. But in terms of their initial clinical trials and testing, they're very much held to the same type of standards. I would argue you guys run clinical trials with these. <laughs> well, we don't run them in humans. I mean, the, I didn't know that they were, I mean, at least for the developed world, so they had different um, regulatory authorities in the US and England, for example, and they tried to harmonize the things like the fiber to make uh, the model to harmonize everything to be able to, for example, if we, if we, do, if we make a vaccine in Europe, be able to sell it in the uh, US because they have the same, you know, uh, same standards, yeah. Yeah, exactly, same quality control. Because if you do not have a same quality control, the American people will never, you know, take the vaccine to develop the country. So I know that for developed countries, they harmonize. Try to harmonize everything. Um, but actually, even when for the vaccine that are produced in India, usually they are tested here mm -hmm. and then the production. Mm -hmm. so the vaccine has been developed in, in US, and they've been tested in US, and then they trust the production and then they make it cheaper. So this is a quality control. This is the same quality control. So I know I'm kind of thinking of that particular thing, so like my mental bag. But like for example, we had that that um mixing pharmacy in Boston where they did right. the injection of the medicinitis into the um where it the was right. fine, yeah. yeah. So I'm saying like so the, the vaccines are not almost you know compulsory. Right. So that you, you don't really opt into potentially well I mean you do but like not to the same degree you need other medications. Exactly. And they're and they have to me like the American are thinking potential for contamination. So like that's what I was asking, like, were they help a higher standard manufacturing than other pharmaceutical or pharmaceutical lines? Yeah, no, I think they are the because this lines. That's what I was trying to get at. What's this like, so is that by you yeah. know FDA coming in, parachuting like once a week versus maybe once a month for other stuff. But, like I don't know how it's done, but mm -hmm. how's QC done, right? I, I don't, I don't right. want to get into that discussion. No, we're just asking <laughs> that in general. Painstaking me. Um <laughs> well, whatever, right? But, um, yeah, no, it, you're right. So I think um, liquid medications in general, if they need to be sterile and they need to be injected, they tend to have more frequent QC run on them. But I don't think that's an FDA regulation. I think that's the companies themselves because they don't want to be associated with you know one of those types. Of, they don't want to be arrested like that. So um, although he was a very extreme. Case. I mean, that, that's that's extraordinarily rare, something like that negligent. Well, but that's, but, that's going um, back to why you're having this discussion. Is, is, it's like the disproportionate sense of the general public perception of something that's magnified beyond the proportion of which it occurred. Mm -hmm. And so everybody bombs on to that. Right. So all of a sudden, exactly. like, there, there, there's a green of sand on the floor. Oh, the floor is dirty as hell. There was plenty of yeah. sand. You know, it's like, 
know, it, it can have rational discussion about this kind of stuff. Exactly. Because what in the general it? media and the lack of um, people in general's knowledge about science in general is yeah. it's skewed in one sense and not existent in another, right? And and, and, but in fairness, and, and this is something that, you know, obviously I wish I could convince every parent that this is a critical thing to do if, you're, if your child is, is medically um, qualified to, to be vaccinated. But in fairness, you know, when you think back to that idea of um, the fetal tissue and seeing this, you know, this really kind of inflammatory language and then having it in, in somebody's head who doesn't, doesn't read or know much about science, having it really co confirmed by the CDC and not realizing that, well, it means it's a, it's a little bit of lipid from a cell line from a fetus from 50 years ago. It, it's, it, it's really complicated because as you say, you see this one reaction and then there's also the element of, well, if it's one in a million, but my baby is the one, then it doesn't matter that it was one in a million, you know? But at the same time, the part that we're not seeing in the general public, although we're starting to see slightly more again, is this idea of, um, you know, we're protecting people against a threat that we don't see every day anymore. And so this visceral idea of, oh my God, the crate is sand on the floor, but never mind, there's like that big beach, like right there, that, you know? Like you should, don't be afraid of that. There's a whole beach. Don't, don't deal with that, you know? And it's sort of like saying, well, knock that wall down so we can sweep the sand out, but then the beach will come in and that would be bad. Um, so yeah, it's a perception issue, but I guess I, I, what I'm kind of very articulately trying to say, inarticulately, wow, um, so inarticulate, I said it wrong. Um, what I'm very inarticulately trying to say is I get in some senses where the misperception comes from. I think we haven't done as good a job as we could have and, and have been doing historically. And um, yeah, so hope to do better, I guess. <laughs> What is the percentage in the trend for kids not being vaccinated in that audience? It depends wildly on what part of the country you're in. Mm -hmm. um, so, where I live, um, specifically in York County, Maine, uh, we, are, we are a little um, finger of Boston that reaches up into another state, and um, we have a a lot of people are very into natural health and blah blah blah. Sorry, not blah. I mean, like it's very important, but um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, so we have a lot of people who like a more holistic view of um, health, and so with our vaccination rate for certain immunizations is about seventy-five percent. That is well below herd immunity threshold. Um, so we're at risk for certain infections to, to explode in town uh, and in the county. But that being said, we're much higher for other vaccines, so we're closer to okay. Um, if you look at, I'm kind of not voting this out. Um, actually, sorry, within my own state, if you look at Northern Maine, their levels of vaccination coverage are much higher. I don't know why just it. If you look at Illinois, Chicago has a rather lower than average um, immunization coverage rate, but Southern Illinois, much higher, very close to maximum. So it's, it's very, very diverse across the country. That is actually really bad news. If you look at the U.S. rate of immunization coverage overall, it's actually not that bad. It's like 94, 95 percent, but that's reflective of large parts of the country being 100 percent covered and others being much lower. The bad news is when you get a population of people who are below herd immunity threshold, you put them all in one place. That's when you're starting to get people. A lot of people getting sick. Um, if those people were across the country equally distributed, we would probably be okay. But 
they're not, they're clustered in one place. So the rates in Southern California are a little bit in flux right now because they've been having measles and pertussis outbreaks for the past three or four years. Um, so now people are starting to revisit the idea of not vaccinating their kids and, and changing their minds. And they've also changed quite a few state laws to try to bolster that and make it more difficult to get exemptions for your kids. Um, and so the rates from California a couple of years ago no longer apply to right this moment right now. But Southern California, a certain county in Southern California, we're in the 60% range. Right? That's, that's lower than a lot of developing countries. So that's, that's, just, that's just not good. <laughs> Has there ever been a lawsuit brought against somebody who wasn't vaccinated who transmitted the disease? So that's an There's interesting a question. I think there are some pending in California. What I want to know, and what I have always wondered, like for years, um, what I've wondered for years is these people who go on TV and claim expertise and found these groups and establish these groups and offer, essentially offer medical advice and dissuade people from getting vaccinated and people who sell books on the matter. I'm curious if one of, I want to see a lawsuit where one of them gets sued because that would be really hard to prove, right? Like I made this decision because I read this book, but it, to me, it, it it's a really interesting legal question. If a child dies because a parent took this advice and, and they're insist, insistent that this is real medical knowledge, are, are, aren't they somehow culpable? And that, that seems like it would be to me, but I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. It seems like I don't know, something about proving intent or something would be in there, I don't know, but um, that's what I'm curious about. But it, it seems to me like those those guys who are, you know, just kind of making their name and their living off of this cause, I, I mean, they, to me, they had a lot of blood on their hands and um, I don't know, I don't know how you, I don't know how you hold people culpable, but I, I'm curious as to how slash when that would happen. Um, if I ask this question, right, uh, are there any administration methods that may not elicit, say, a primitive response from the parent? So say somebody gets a needle, right? Mm -hmm. The mother or father may be concerned. Whereas, say, a non-vector mosquito lands on someone bites them, you don't feel it. So, uh, I just, excuse the question. Um, are there any other options besides just a needle to administer? Sure, oh, sure. Obviously, there are, but I mean, so that's not going to cause the child. <laughs> I mean, right. No, no, I'm with you. Yeah, it's so, so um, confusing. Like, uh, no, I, I, I'm with you. I mean, so, you basically, you know, yeah. Yeah. So there's um so there are oral vaccines. So there's a the rotavirus vaccine we talked about is is oral. Um, it's not routinely given in this country, but if you travel, there's an oral typhoid vaccine. It's actually just pills that you take. Um, and swallow and whatnot. When I was a kid, our polio vaccines were oral, and um, now they're a shock. But the um, so that's that's one thing. There there's an inhaled uh, flu vaccine. It was not used this past year because it turns out it doesn't work quite as well as the injection. Um, so pick your point. Um, there's also. Um, the smallpox vaccine, the way it was administered, was it wasn't a big intramuscular injection, but if you look at the um, the arm of someone a bit, bit older, like my mom has one of these scars. Apparently mom has one. And basically what, what can happen in or what would happen is um, could take something that's more like a more like a 
in a shaped object. And instead of doing a big giant IM injection, you would just do like poke, 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 poke with this pin, which I don't know if that's better or worse. <laughs> it didn't hurt as much apparently, but it went on quite a bit longer. So I don't know what the, you know, what the preference is. But um, there's also something called third DNA vaccines, which we don't have any license yet, but if we ever do, uh, you can administer them by something called a gene gun, which sounds crazy, but it's basically um, it's basically this device that has a um, DNA coupled to some heavy metal particle, it's usually sort of gold or something like that, and um, it's placed against your skin, and it's just like a puff of air. It almost apparently it almost feels something like a glaucoma test if you are of my age range and have had one of those. Um, so it's just yeah, it's just like a hard puff of air. So it's much less painful than getting it, getting an actual injection. Um, so there are other ways, but it, it, it's it's tricky because. Yeah. Um, but taking something orally, you have to think about, um, you know, whatever you're vaccinating is, it has to survive through the digestive tract. Right. And so that's why something like coronavirus was perfect. I mean, it, all, it does survive through the intestinal tract. Is there like admin processes for the vaccines? Is that just for I'm uh, sorry? the absorption and distribution? Yeah, exactly. So there's all the pharmacokinetics and dynamics that you have to take into account. And um, that's for really, uh, really sharp chemistry people to think about. But, so there are other routes of administration, but it's a little more challenging. And then the other aspect of it, too, is that if you um, inhale or swallow something, you're going to primarily elicit something called mucosal immunity. So there's, there's different um, types of immune cell populations at different spots in your body. And the ones that live in your muscles, or, or sorry, under under your muscle tissue, um, are of type A. And the ones that live in your nose, in your lungs, in your gut are type B. And I'm thinking of maybe X and Y, whatever you want to think of it as. Um, so the immunity that you generate might be slightly different depending on how you administer the virus. So for Rota and oral polio vaccine, my swallowing is actually perfect because they their primary site of replication is the GI tract. So that just gave you the perfect type of immunity for those. Um, for flu, inhaling, I would think would have actually been better, but it turns out it's less effective. I think it's because it's harder to get the entire dose on the kid's nose, but um, <laughs> it's that's something that we talk about with the med students all the time is uh, when they're dealing with kids, they have to sometimes think a little differently. Um, based on how kids behave, we had a, a um, herpes gingivitis stomatitis case, translation to cold sore, um, where we had a, a kid have a cold sore here and then it started appearing on other spots and we were trying to get them to diagnose this as a cold sore. And, um, you know, why it happened like that is because the kids were rubbing at their face because it feels funny and they're drooling and they're just spreading the <laughs> virus all over the face and um and then uh, it, was, it was great to see a bunch of like a bunch of uh respectfully 24 year olds say well why wouldn't you simply instruct the child not to do that <laughs> 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 well, they're always touching your, always touching your, everybody's always touching their nose and they're stamping there right yeah, yeah exactly so, so that's why you tend to get a yeah. tigo following a cold sore in little kids because they're Sticking their fingers up their nose right. and then rubbing it on their face. But yeah, no, their face feels funny, so they're squishing at it. But the reason I brought up little kids is um, having watched my older one get the nasal flu mist a few times, it's really hard to get that whole dose of <laughs> without them going and rubbing it all out. So I honestly think that might be more the issue. But <laughs> yeah. You got the geographic question? The geographic. I feel like are different portions, different areas of the country at different rates. Major. Oh, yeah. Is that you? No. Major. 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 Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the part that is like, so you're saying just recently, like the rate of vaccination for total vaccinations, like where's that data coming from? That like you're saying, like you and I, we don't have our records. I don't know. Like so, who has? Who so has the, that the data? CDC. So they're looking at. Um, 
So when we say vaccine coverage rate, we're typically talking about kids up through 18 because that's who we have the best records on because typically we need to present them to enroll in public school. So yeah, that's who we're, that's primarily who we're referring to. That's um, the federal data is, is where we pull that number from. So point being, for something like hepatitis B, I think you brought it up earlier, um, it's a great example. So there's no way across the country that is at, that we're ever actually gonna know what that rate is exactly. And the reason for that is that vaccine was invented, I recall, um, and, and was released to the public when I was a senior in high school because I was going to college and they said, would you like the hepatitis B vaccine? It just came out. Um, so I said, yeah, why not? Um, so my thought is, and what I tell my students is, is if you have a patient who is older than me, they probably have not been vaccinated against hepatitis B unless they were traveling or had some sort of respect or for it, right? If they were an IV drug user or, or whatever. If they, for whatever reason, decided to go get it, then they would be vaccinated. If they had no stimulation to ever go get it, then they probably aren't. So the way that we teach the students to think in terms of infectious disease is um, kind of from a triage point of view. Somebody comes in, they appear to have acute hepatitis. You have to figure out what do they have, A, B, C, D, it's not really a thing, but it kind of is, um, or E. And so you have to ask them certain questions. You have to look at how old are you? Have you been traveling? Have you been, are you a drug user? What are your risk factors? Have you been vaccinated against hepatitis B? So um, the thought being is age is, is where I teach them to think about hep B because they probably haven't been vaccinated. And so, um, but the point being there is we don't have good data on that because we know now all the kids who are up through age 18 are primarily mostly been vaccinated. Uh, but someone that's 46, who knows? That was a really long way of answering that, sorry. <laughs> Context. Context is everything. All right. All right. Thank you so much.